news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. It's KP's video news, y'all. That's right. Straight out the wood, baby. What's up? What's up, folks? Just over here having a little fun. Yep, those days been over. Anyway, yeah, folks, just having a little fun here today. And I'm uh this first story, man, really brought, you know, made me feel good, man. It's a good a good feeling to know uh that uh yeah. The first domino. The first domino fell today. The jury convicted Steve Bannon of contempt of Congress. The first domino fell. Yep. So a, a jury today convicted Steve Bannon on two counts of contempt of Congress for denying and defying a subpoena from the House Committee investigating the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. The 68-year-old political strategist who served as former President uh, T. Rump's campaign CEO and White House advisor faces a minimum sentence of 30 days uh, and a maximum of one year in jail for each count. All right, that's two years. The jury took less than three hours to reach a verdict in the two misdemeanor counts. They began deliberating on uh, Friday after hearing testimony from just two witnesses over the course of a week. Bannon and his attor attorneys vowed to appeal and criticize the select committee and federal prosecutors for pursuing the case. And uh, so the overreaching of the government in this case has been extraordinary at every level. Ha, ha, ha. They had every right to do what they did. Speaking to reporters outside the courtroom after, after the verdict, uh, Bannon thanked the judge and the jury after the week-long trial but remained defiant towards the select committee. Yep. Yeah, I tell you, man. So a select committee spokesman did uh, did not immediately respond when asked asked about uh, a worthless comment that uh, that you know that Bannon had made. But Matthew Graves, the U.S. Attorney for D.C., applauded the decision. Says the subpoena to Steve Bannon was not an invitation. That could be rejected or ignored, Gray stated in the statement. Bannon had an obligation to appear before the House Select Committee to give testimony and provide documents. His refusal to do so was deliberate, and now a jury has found that he must pay the consequences. Bannon's lawyers not chose not to rep, uh, present their own case, offering uh, no defense witnesses, no defense witnesses whatsoever. Uh, Evan Corcoran, one of Bannon's attorneys, said in the closing argument Friday that there was plenty of reasonable doubt concerning his client's guilt. We didn't feel the need to put on a defense, as his, uh, his lawyer said. You should have some better lawyers than that. If your lawyer said you didn't need a defense uh, <laughs> for, not, for not answering the subpoena, man, this is, this is wonderful, man. This is so good. Anyway, prosecutors had argued. The case presented a straightforward question of whether Bannon met the legal obligations laid out for him in the subpoena last year. The case is not completed, but it is important, Molly Gaston, the U.S. attorney, said in her closing argument Friday, when it came down to it, he did not want to recognize Congress's authority or play by con uh, government's rules. Bannon was indicted in November after the House voted to hold him in contempt for failing to show up for a deposition and turn over documents as demanded by the January 6th collect, uh, Select Committee subpoena. The subpoena issued on September 23rd ordered Bannon to turn over a wide range of documents by October 7th of that uh, year and appear before the committee for a deposition on October 14th. An attorney for Bannon, Robert Costello, said in the letters to the committee that his client would not comply because Trump had exerted executive privileges and because of an ongoing civil case at the time between the former president and the select committee. While Cor Corcoran had 
told the jury Friday that the defense felt no need to present a case. Bannon's lawyers expressed frustration throughout the trial that they had been handcuffed from presenting certain arguments. You didn't present them, so you wasn't handcuffed. The U.S. District Judge Carl Nichols had ruled Bannon would not be allowed to argue at trial that he was relying on the advice of his lawyers and not complying with the subpoena or that any assertion of executive privilege excused him from meeting the committee's demands. On Thursday, Sean told the court his client would have testified in his own defense if Nichols had not prohibited them from mounting those arguments. He's wanted to testify publicly in this case under oath to tell the court, the jury and the public, exactly what the true facts of the case are, Sean said. However, on the advice of counsel, he has decided not to testify because he understands that he would be barred from telling the true facts, <laughs> explaining why he did what he did and why he did not do what he did not do in relation to the committee subpoena. He wanted to testify on the oath to explain that at all times. He believed he was doing what, what the law required him to do based on his lawyer's advice. So the lawyers need to be locked up to it if they gave him that bad defense. The defense tr uh, team tried to complicate the prosecution's narrative of an open and shut case with the suggestions of a political bias against Bannon. During the closing arguments, Corcoran even compared the signature of uh, Representative Benny Thompson, the select committee's chairman, that was on a, uh, on a subpoena with other examples of the signature in an attempt to show doubt in the jury that the subpoena was valid. But throughout the trial, prosecutors pushed a straightforward case that Bannon had obviously, and, uh, and he had an obvious obligation to comply with the subpoena's demands and that he failed to do so. There were two witnesses, because it's as simple as it seems, Prosecutor Amanda Vaughn told the jury Friday, how much clearer could the subpoena have been? The only person talking about politics in this case is seated over there. And the defendant, Vaughn, added, the only reason they wanted to talk about any of these things is that they don't want to talk about his contempt. Bannon is scheduled for sentencing on October 21st. Come on, man. Good riddance. Lock him up. Lock him up, man. Lock him up. Just like you did this brother, this brother over here that got locked up, man. This guy, this case here, this is a man that was in solitary confinement for over 15 years. Reveals, reveals, uh, you know, how, you know, how that, you know, how a hobby changed his life. And a man deemed so dangerous, he was locked up in solitary confinement for 15 years, has revealed how a chance encounter turned his life around through the unlikely but redemptive power of gardening. Jam uh, Jamala Taylor, 50 years old, spent half of his 31 incarcerated years alone in his cell at a notorious Pelican Bay State Prison in California, uh, Supermax, in Del Norte County, California. But a change in the law and crossing paths with a non or uh, nonprofit organization called the Inside Gardena uh, Garden Program, IGP, led to both his unexpected freedom and his extraordinary transformation. Taylor had been a drug addicted gang member and said, there, there's always a great regret and there's shame. I was lost to the streets. I had a child's mind having fun, hanging out. That was my thing. I'm ashamed and embarrassed by that person. He declined to reveal the exact nature of the crime that led him to being locked up. And he was unable to answer the question out of respect for my family, uh, the folks I've harmed so deeply, and the life I've built for myself today. But he added, I will tell you, more than three decades ago, three decades ago, I was very a very different person. I'm not proud of that person, but I do accept responsibility. Nearly half of his incarceration was spent alone, something he found difficult to bear. Prison is trauma. And he, he was also deprived of nature and says that that affected him more than he could have imagined. For decades, everything he touched was metal or concrete. He began to dream of walking barefoot across lush grass. Taylor would have remained in prison until he died were it not for a change in the law. He said, I was a lifer, and at that time I was sentenced. California did not let lifers go. 
They just did not par parole lifers. But new youth offender laws brought in across the state meant those who committed crimes before they, before they turned age 23, later extended to age 26, would be eligible for parole hearings. In 2015, Taylor was released back into the prison's general population with a new unexpected shot at getting out one day. That followed a landmark uh, legal settlement between Pelican Bay prisons in California that fully uh, ended solitary confinement for, for swaths of the prison population held there only because of gang affiliation rather than bad behavior. One day, Taylor saw a piece of paper pinned to a board advising uh, and advertising IGP, which was running classes and creating a garden within the prison ground. He said, you plant something. It's really a really beautiful uh, feeling. So we got a chance to go out and work in the garden. So it helped me re-socialize. Uh, California prisons are, are largely socially constructed around gangs and race. So if if you are a Mexican person or a white person, the social rules dictate that we uh, we can't hang out together. But in that space where they do the gardening, they could. So it's kind of like two hours a week of normalization of being able to just, you know, just let your hair down and not be not be guarded. So it's therapeutic and rehabilitative. Uh, and that impact was kind of like bringing calm to chaos. And he continued working with IGP. Taylor started to sign up for more groups, including Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. And it was a he said he was an emotionally, emotionally literate person. He said, I didn't grow up speaking about my feelings and being. A pr uh, in prison kind of compounded that it's not the place to be introspective and articulate uh, what you feel and access feelings other than anger but now he began to confront his problems drugs gangs and anger taylor eventually went before the parole board and was re released in december 2020 and he felt euphoria but it was a difficult time too the 1990s the 2000 2010s it all passed him by he didn't know how to work a cell phone, and he became overwhelmed at, at Walmart, not just the amount of people, but with the amount of stuff that they had at the store. I didn't know where I fit in or where I was going to fit in. There was something I couldn't, uh, that was something I couldn't really express to my mother or my family. All they wanted to see was the joy of, of me being out, so I don't know where I would be without IGP. IGP, which worked as a youth detention uh, has worked in youth detention centers and men's and women's prisons, also runs a reentry program to help participants on the outside. Staff met new releases, gave them toiletries, go, uh, go somewhere to eat, and helped them uh, navigate their new lives. Taylor says he was never tempted to return to his old life. That's really my greatest fear, my only fear, be, uh, becoming the man I was, that he was. It's a good thing, man. They got a good plan going on. Uh, yep. So Taylor is an IGP reentry coordinator. That's right. Helping people whose shoes he walked in just 18 months ago. He has also helped IGP write a new curriculum for the correspondence course and has undertaken a sociology degree. He has reconnected with his family and lives alone in what had been a rental home owned by his twin sister. Uh, he plans to create uh, create his, his, his very own garden there. But part of the reason Taylor signed up to attend his first session with IGP was because he sometimes dreams of walking around barefoot, barefoot across the lawn. And he said, I often go outside with no shoes and socks on just to walk in the grass. We don't really appreciate that until we are deprived of it and get back to a situation where we can touch a tree touch a leaf, touch some grass, put our hands in soil. I appreciate it in a way that's probably unique if you haven't been removed from it totally. Wow. Taylor is a critic, is critical of the American penal system, which he dismisses as a business that doesn't serve anyone. Nobody should profit off the misery of human beings, he said. And uh, so the prisons are a for-profit, for prisons in every state. Uh, and every federal prison are for-profit organizations. They make profits. They make money off of, off of housing inmates.
So it's like, wow, I'm telling you, man. This year marks IGP's 20th anniversary. Taylor's excited about what lies ahead and bringing green to intentionally, you know, barren places, lighting people up, helping them to get to a place where they can change their lives as I have changed mine. That's absolute magic. And I want to be uh, able to scale that. It's amazing, man. See, people can change, man. You know, people can change. But all they have, all they need is an opportunity. They need an opportunity to change. That's why I thank Brother Skip Townsend in L.A. that has an uh, organization called Second Call. That's the number two, small N-D-C-A-L-L, -L, Second Call. Uh, and what they do is they help uh, inmates that have been locked up, man, get, you know, get training for jobs. You know, I'm talking about serious training, man, to become plumbers and, and, and electricians and all kind of stuff. So, you know, plus they do like a gang intervention and uh, they try to quell and stop some, you know, activities in the neighborhood, man, before, you know, before bad things happen. You know, people usually come to them and say, hey, man, we got a problem that's, that's brewing. Can you uh, help us negotiate this problem, you know, with the guys on the other side, man, so we can keep, you know, keep the, uh, you know, all the harm to people down to a minimum. And uh, thank, shout out to uh, Skip Townsend and, uh, and all the people at Second Call in Los Angeles. Man, man, you guys are doing a wonderful job, man. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm watching you guys. I'm, you know, just like everybody else is watching. And uh, I was really proud to see that the city trusted you guys enough to give you that building and also to give you the keys to uh, Lamert Park, the park. So, you know, I'm telling you, man, you guys have came a long way, man. You know, a lot of you guys that that run that are in charge with uh, that are in charge with uh, second call have guys that have been to prison themselves. Anyway, I'm going to hit this last story real quick. It got a grim reality. It said a local civil rights organization speaks up after police union calls for a judge to resign. So Las Vegas, the Clark County Black Caucus, and uh, joins the chapters of the NAACP and the ACLU to speak up after Las Vegas Pro, uh, Police Protection Association the union that represents the Las Vegas Metro Police Department officials called for a judge to step down. On July 11th, Clark County District Judge Erica Ballou was addressing a defendant when she made comments about the relationship between police and African Americans. She said, you're the uh, one making the decisions not to walk away from the cops. You're a black man in America. You know you uh, don't want to be anywhere where cops are. The judge Baloo said, you, you know you don't want to be anywhere where the cops are because I know I don't. And I'm a middle-aged, middle-class black woman. I don't want to be around where cops are because I don't know if I'm going to walk away alive or not. And the video circulated of Judge Baloo making those comments, which the uh, police union uh, caused them to, to call for her to resign from the bench. And for ethics investigation against her. Now, recent reports of judicial misconduct prompted local civil rights organizations and uh, the Black Caucus, like I said, NAACP and ACLU, to speak up about the statements uh, in support of the judge. So judge Ballou's statements reflect the grim reality for African Americans in the United States and in Clark County. Her statements reflect not only her truth, but uh, those of the black community that disproportionately suffer as victims of police killings. It is a common practice in black households to educate and caution your children about interaction with law enforcement and whenever possible, avoid contact for fear of being profiled, accosted, harassed, or worse, and with instructions to go around police to get where you're going. I believe Judge Belusa's uh, advice was expressed from the cautious viewpoint and not disparaging to just of uh, uh, to just and fair law enforcement when practice, I I agree with that one hundred percent. I agree with that one hundred percent, man. Yep. In a release, uh, 
and the NAACP Statement of Support, the Civil Rights Organization reference to the 2021 Police Violence Report, which states, while African-American people make up only 13% of the United States population, they make up 28% of victims of police shooting. 28%, man. Wow, that's twice the number, twice the number of the, of the number of people that, that, that populate the country. Wow, 13% of the population, but 28% of the police, ki of police killing. Wow, that's something, man. That's something right there. But anyway, my I salute you, Judge Baloo. You told the truth. And uh, if they, they can't handle the truth, that's on them. You know who it is. You know who it is, folks. KP's video news, y'all. That's right. KP's video news, y'all.